you. I became interested in fluorescent minerals by accident. Um, I happened to see somebody with the light on it. I think it was Manny Robbins who writes the books for fluorescence, and his books are now out of print. But um, we got a light. Dick and I went to a uh, Scottsdale uh, Community College. We went and took an evening course on mineralogy because, frankly, I knew nothing about it. And um, a little man who took us on a field trip had an old-time battery that he hooked up that was showing fluorescence, and I got hooked. Um, so after that, we uh, became interested in what the fluorescence was all about. Can you raise your voice a little bit? Okay. Uh, I need to speak a little louder, okay? Um, and we started... Uh, looking at what Arizona had to offer. And it's amazing. We are one of the most fluorescent states in the union. And Manny Robbins, and we met him, um, and he was from New Jersey. And he was trying to tell me that I shouldn't be hung up on New Jersey because Arizona had it too. We just didn't have so much of it in one place. We had ours scattered all over the state. And he encouraged me to start looking at Arizona and traveling around and finding out what we would find in fluorescence. And I was absolutely amazed. The picture that you see here was one that um, is just, that specimen is amazing, but it was A.L. Flagg who found it. And it was down at Ruby, Arizona. And it's one of the most beautiful ones that we have. Um, Stan Celestian, and I don't think he's here, but Stan Celestian did all the photography of the minerals um, and the, uh, for me. And so we have a big thanks to him. Um, we have some future projects in the works, too. On the slides I'm going to show you, Stan has coded them in terms of if he was using long wave, he made an A on it. Uh, medium wave is B, and short wave is C. So you'll be able to see what, what kind of light he was using when he did this. This is that uh, in daylight, that specimen. Um, and I think it was Bill Yudowitz who found it when we were moving the museum out. And it's just an absolutely gorgeous specimen. All right, and this is calcite. And what you're going to find is that if you have a light and you go out and look, you will find calcite laying all over this state. In mines, outside of mines, road cuts, it's all over the place. And this is a close-up of that same specimen. And right now it's in my custody, but it will end up in a museum at some point. Mm. And it, it's like fire. Um, I'm going to start with calcite because it is, um, Arizona could be called the calcite capital. We've got it laying around on the desert. We've got it in hills. We've got it in mines. Um, this piece came um, from the brick mine, and that's short wave and that's long wave. And this is the entrance into the brick mine. And a lot of these places, you, you would not be allowed probably inside there anymore. They've boarded most of this up. But 40 years ago, it was all open, so it was easy to get at. And this calcite, I won on a, as a door prize somewhere. It was just amazing. I call it my cathedral. And it comes from the Ajax mine. And that mine has been underwater for historically for years and years and years. But someone had gotten that out. You cannot even get it anywhere near the inside of the Ajax mine at this point. That's a picture of it. Um, it's underwater. This is a Bisbee uh, tabular calcite that I think is just beautiful. And it's one that's in my collection. And that's what it looks like under uh, long wave, okay? And more calcite, calcite on quartz from Ruby, Arizona. And the pure to potential mine down near Yuma has lots of calcite. And Rye, Arizona has lots of calcite. And this comes from Safford. And um, you can see 
In daylight, it's very different. Uh, fluorescent, uh, very, very beautiful reds. And down at Bisbee in southeastern Arizona, I was just strolling around on the desert and talking to people who lived there or who were also hunting. And the stuff laying on the desert floor, they call crazy calcite. And um, so I picked some up. And almost wherever you go, Amethyst Hill had a whole outcrop of calcite nearby. It looks like bricks. Um, St. John's, Arizona was probably the most interesting story, though, in my collecting life, is I went on a field trip with the Payson Club, and they went up to St. John's onto the Indian Reservation into the garbage dump for St. John's. And I thought, oh, they were looking for fossils. And I thought, oh boy, in a garbage dump. So I went in and I became immediately distracted by what it looked to me like calcite. Only the stuff that I was seeing first was very dirty, covered in mud, and um, just a very faint glow that I got when I, I hit it with some ultraviolet light. And I thought, well, this is the strangest calcite I have ever seen. And then I took it home and cleaned it up. And it was some of the be most beautiful, in terms of color, of calcite. Recently, the Payson Club went back to St. John's, and they found lots of this. In digging through the garbage dump, the guys with the garbage um, had uncovered the seam that produced this stuff. Um, very beautiful. Then, chalcedony roses. That's calcite. It's all over Arizona. Now some other specimens. This is by no means a presentation of everything I ever found. It's just highlights of things I have found. Um, chalcedony roses, Saddle Mountain near Tonopah, outside of the valley, um, known for its chalcedony roses. And it was one of the first sites I looked at. Um, the chalcedony roses are usually a creamy white in uh, daylight, and almost all of them glow green. Um, some of them, uh, especially on shortwave. And there are Duncan, has some beautiful ones, very brilliant. And this is the Anderson mine, um, which is a uranium mine. And of course, we picked up lots of chalcedony roses there, and they're brilliant. No, it's not working. Uh, here we go. Um, outside of the valley, Potts Canyon near Superior, very, very uh, popular collecting site. Very difficult to get to because you had to go down a wash. And in the spring, the wash was flowing, so you got to get wet if you wanted to go. But embedded in the side of that little canyon um, were geodes uh, that had chalcedony in them that were just brilliant. And you just dug them out. In order to not carry all heavy geodes that might not have glowed out, you put a bag over your head and glowed them out there so you could carry it out. Um, and here we have a case where the water was flowing. But this is what those chalcedony geodes looked like. Um, and most of them are single, some of them are double. And they're just extremely beautiful. This is not a picture of one I found. It's just uh, one that Jeff Scoville uh, took a picture of. And he found one with actual crystals inside of the geode out there. This is a very atypical but very beautiful one that we got from him, his picture. Then nearby is the Raymert mine outside of Superior. And that had um, lots of different uh, minerals in it that did glow. But we had stuff that kind of reminded you of some of the New Jersey ones. Um, they weren't as plentiful, but um, as time eroded on over the 40 years, it was, there was less and less because people could get in there and collect it. Um, and at the Raymart mine, we also had, he took some long wave, short wave ones. Um, 
down in the area near Castle Dome was the Hull Mine, and originally 40 years ago you could get in there and collect. Now you can't, but someone has taken over the Hull Mine and turned it into a tourist uh, attraction. And the nice thing about it is you can actually drive that truck right down into the mine. Um, and people who went collecting with us did that. Um, in the Hull Mine, were beautiful specimens that, specimens that remind you of um, New Jersey material. Um, so we really, it was true, we really did have it. Manny Robbins was right. And um, some of it was a brighter color. The reds, of course, are your calcites. Then nearby was um, a trench in the desert. And um, we, found in the side of the desert, we found a lot of uh, fluorite and galena. Uh, and you could just pick them out. And the amazing thing was they were often the correct shapes that you were looking for. Um, the, the natural colored one, but we found so many um, of the, those specimens. I think that, that area is now again closed. You can't really get into it. Uh, some of these were taken early on. And near Duncan, we also found fluorite, um, and very nice specimens. Fluorite is also all over Arizona. And if you watch your road cuts, if you watch uh, trenches in the desert, you're apt to pick some up. And this one came from the Spectre Mine, which is up closer to the valley. Um, very, very beautiful. And it, the, the neat thing about it is it's that purple blue in daylight also. And then down near Tucson, down near here, we found something that was a little bit of New Jersey. And it was a little cave in uh, the rocks. And inside was just beautiful specimens. This was on the, uh, 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 there was a, a company um, that was going to blast this. We tried to save it, but they blew it up. And recently, someone came and told me they found pieces of the material out on the desert. So it's laying around out there, but it was just gorgeous. And we have the calcite. Um, willemite and fluorite all together. And this is another one from that same area. And then the Purple Passion Mine um, that Bill Gardner has, has again very beautiful multicolored specimens. There's another one. The calcites in Arizona are especially brilliant. And a nice long trip up of the mountain, if you feel like walking, is to get up to the top of Miller Peak down near Sierra Vista. Um, it's a nice walk up, and you get to haul anything you find down, so you're very selective, because you're usually it's going down at night also. Um, it's a great big wall, and inside is willamite. It, it's especially got more willamite than other places do and very brilliant willamite. Um, then all across Aragona, as you're walking around, you will find thunder eggs, you will find nodules. And when you cut them open, many, many of them have fluorescent material inside. And in, near Kingman, we found onyx. And root beer onyx near Payson. And this site is up high on a hill, and you have to work a little bit to get to it. But you had light colored stuff and some very dark colored. The slide, this slide in his, pre, of his presentation for me uh, was the most popular one at a recent uh, uh, pace and uh, Rockhound group, I gave this presentation, and this was the slide they liked the best. And it was because it showed it in natural color, it showed it on long wave, it showed it on medium wave, and it showed it, or um, medium, and then also on short wave. 
And the mid-range was what attracted them, is that they said they now have lights, and some of them have mid-range, but they don't find pe pe pictures anywhere of what the mid-range should look like. So my next project will be to go back through all of these and pull out all the mid-waves and, and make a set of cards, basically, that follow this one. Then at Wilcox, we found oregonite. And down at Helvetia, near Tucson here, um, calcite with uh, oregonite. And hemamorphite near Dragoon. What you can see is that no matter where you go in Arizona, you're going to find something that's fluorescing. And at Dudleyville, um, up in the corner up there, um, we had um, selenite crystals that had um, inclusions in them. And I found the very same ones at Pumpkin Center um, on the way to Payson. And then we had the reef mine near Miller Peak. Um, and in the reef mine, there was the entry was blocked, but we uh, found a hole, a sinkhole. So I went in, and they forgot to tell me that there were bats in there. But we did find scheelite, and scheelite is one of the most difficult uh, minerals to find and to collect. It tends to dry out, fall apart on you, and it's also, uh, we had a lot of scheelite mines here, but it was very difficult to find really good scheelite. Um, but at the reef mine, we did get in there and I found some. And we have scheelite in quartz at Johnson City. The story here was that um, Tom Warren, who used to be the, he is now deceased, but he was the president of the Fluorescent Mineral Society, and he knew I was doing this project. He had discovered some crystals, quartz crystals at Johnson City that had inclusions of scheelite inside them. And they, they produced this kind of a uh, specimen. This was his biggest specimen before he died. He sent me a, a, he kept this location secret so no one could find it. He sent me the directions to it and all his information and the big beautiful specimen that he had caught there. This isn't real large, but it's beautiful. The inclusions are brilliant. And then we did find uh, more scheelite in different places, opalite. Um, again, something you will find in all your nodules here in Arizona. And we had one real rare one. It was a fluorescent and phosphorescent fluorite in a little hole called the Bluebird Mine. And the phosphorescence happened in daylight. All right, this is just an incredible little place. Then we uh, had mines. Um, Dick and Stan Celestian had the, mid, uh, the Amethyst Hill Mine. We found lots of different things there, calcite and willamite, and cerusite and oregonite and willamite, um, which fluoresced. And down near Benson, we found opal. And I always thought that somebody dumped this opal there. It just didn't seem to be natural, but it was beautiful opal. And then near Wickenburg, we found opal inside of nodules. And here we have um, some more of, this is from Burrow Creek, where we have the hyalite opal. And there was one uh, mine that Manny Robbins wanted to take us to because it had beautiful uh, fluorescence in it. We never did get in. We got up there. But um, this is what it, he said he found. And we found a picture of it on Mindap. Then we had our, our own Midnight Owl Mine, which we claimed. And that was because Manny Robbins found out that there was a very, very rare fluorescence. And Arizona was one of the few places that had it. And it was called Eucryptite. And so we got him in there. Um, getting to this mine was a seven mile trip down a wash and you didn't go if it rained. Um, but it was an incredible mine. And this is Dick's 
<laughs> we did it because it was so rare. Um, we did a lot of field trips for clubs and let people come in and take it. Um, and there were many, many other minerals in there. We just let people come to collect. It was a great collecting site. But this is eucryptite. It's really kind of ugly in daylight. And then you fluoresce it, and it's just beautiful. There was a tailing pile that I couldn't even walk up. I had to crawl, and I had to slide down. And it was this stuff just crushed up. And um, very rare mineral. Sometimes we had a little color of other things on it, but we pulled out lots and lots of eucryptite. And uh, Stan did a nice picture. Um, eucryptite is the inner um, part of a spodumen crystal. It's an alteration of a spodumen crystal. And the spodumen crystals look like this, and he did several of them. And they're, they're very interesting, but they're nothing in compared to the brilliance of the eucryptite. And then we found some more thunder eggs near Morristown, and, and um, Les isn't here, but I heard that he put a claim on the little hill that has these. Um, the neat thing was that in some of them, you would find a crystal of fluorite, and how that crystal got in there all by its little self, we don't really know. And then we finally, at Crown King, we had powellite. These are just some of the different minerals I found. There are more. I didn't put them all in this. Um, but what you need to know is that for now that lights have become accessible and are not as expensive as they used to be, we have children, we have other, um, lots of clubs are interested now in fluorescence and people have access to the lights. And this uh, presentation is basically to show you you're living in the right place. Just go out there and find them, they're out there. And it makes collecting really a lot of fun because you don't have to spend a lot of money except to get the light. And then you're on your own and we have lots of places to go and find them. It's been a real fun 40 years. <laughs> I'm going to retire. <laughs> Okay, and Dick, um, he has part of this presentation when we do it at, um, is um, how fluorescent works and how these lights work and how they, um, what you need to know about the scientific end of it. Well, Marty got all excited and jumped to the coals of fire slide because uh, that's her favorite, I think. Uh, Les had asked that the presentation include something about the history of UV light and the, uh, the history of UV lamps that were used over the years. So we have a little bit of that here. Um, typically, there wasn't a lot of fluorescent mineral collecting years back because the lamps were very, very expensive. It's becoming more popular now because lamp prices are coming down. Um, the, the, pic the pictures that she showed you, that was, those were taken with a $400 lamp. Uh, people now can get $40 ones that they're not, aren't as good, but they're good enough and they make the, uh, the hobby interesting. Fluorescence is a subcategory of luminescence. Luminescence being when something emits light, but it's not hot. Think firefly. Uh, fluorescence is a subcategory of that, and phosphorescence is a subcategory of that. And, and uh, Marty showed you the example of the, the uh, fluorite there that fluoresced one color, and then when you turn the UV, UV light out, it phosphoresced a different color, which is kind of interesting. Um, as to what, we'll go over this quickly, what uh, ultraviolet light is, it's over here where you can't see it. We see visible light. The infrared is beyond the red. It's what you feel when you walk out in the sunlight. The ultraviolet is also there, but you don't feel it until much later when you're sunburned. Um, the UV light was discovered in 1801 by a German physicist. He separated light, sunlight with a prism, 
And then he had the idea of putting some film out beyond the ultraviolet, out beyond the violet that he could see. And he found that there was something that was causing the film to be exposed out in that region. So then they knew there was such a thing. We, uh, we see a very narrow range of the ultra, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. The ultraviolet is uh, below that, and it's divided up into A, B, and C. If you look at the literature, they talk about A, B, and C. Why is it divided that way? Um, it, it's because it has different effects. The different wavelengths affect materials different ways, and in various industries, they use it for different purposes, medical and industrial, and they refer to it as A, B, and C. Um, here's a little picture that just reminds us that when we get sunburned, it's the A that's doing it. The, uh, most of the B and all of the C is taken out by the atmosphere, and particularly the ozone layer, and it's fortunate for us that it does. Um, the, so, the so UV light initially, of course, came from the sun. It's produced by electric arcs. That's why you see welders wearing these big heavy gloves and their jackets and their goggles and everything because they have to protect themselves from the UV. Um, later, it was produced by mercury vapor lights and that was the big thing that started fluorescent mineral collection. And then recently we've gotten the LED and the lasers. But the mercury vapor was and still is very significant. The type of UV that you get depends upon the mix of glasses, mix of gases that you have in the tube and the pressure of the gas in there. When they make them, they also have to select a very specific kinds of glass. Some, uh, some glasses uh, transmit various wavelengths. So if you aren't careful about your glass selection, you don't get the wavelength that you want. The UV lamps are very much related to the fluorescent lamps that we had for lighting for many, many years. The difference is your fluorescent lighting has a phosphor a coating on the tube. You have mercury vapor in there that's exciting the phosphor and the phosphors were carefully selected to produce white light. The mercury vapor lights that we use for fluorescent mineral collecting don't have the phosphor. And uh, the history of fluorescent minerals started back in 1819 when a, f a couple of fellows saw that fluorite uh, fluoresced. And then a little bit later, well, quite a bit later, a uh, fellow by the name of Stokes, whose name pops up all over the literature, he uh, <clears throat> saw that uranium glass fluoresced, and he coined the term fluorescent. Uh, what causes the fluorescence? There are several different mechanisms. Some minerals, and in fact some materials, more generally speaking, are intrinsically fluorescent. You sign a UV light on them and they fluoresce. Some are not intrinsically fluorescent, but if there are various kinds of defects in them, then that allows electrons to fluoresce. And then there's the third category where the material's pure form will not fluoresce, but some impurities in them will for us. A common example of that is the uranium. A little bit of uranium in chalcedony makes it for us brilliantly green. Uh, why do they, why do we get all these very distinct colors? Different colors from different minerals or different minerals with impurities or different minerals with defects, depending on what it may be. 
If you want to know that, you have to get yourself a book on quantum physics where you learn that at a very low scale level or the very small level, things don't happen continuously. They happen in increments. And this little cartoon shows that UV energy comes in to the atom. It applies energy to an electron, takes it to a higher state, and then it doesn't stay there. Some energy has lost its heat, but it will display a very distinct color depending upon where that electron was in that atom. And the history of portable UV lights, that's kind of interesting. They were first used in 1903 in the zinc mines in uh, Franklin, New Jersey. And they had a lot of problems. They would, some of the zinc ores that were good looked like just zinc ores that were bad because they couldn't process them. They fouled up their smelters. Then they had to tear the smelter down and rebuild it. So they really needed ways to distinguish the ores that they could process from the ones that they could not. And um, they found out that ultraviolet light would make the shelite ore of the zinc fluoresce very brightly. So the first lamps were iron arc lamps. Picture yourself down three, 400 feet below the surface, walking in water with a battery pack, a step-up transformer that went up to 90,000 volts and two exposed bolts with the arc between them lighting up the rock so you could see what the zinc was. Okay, that worked, but you know, it wasn't that great. Then in, in the 30s, the mercury vapor lights came about and they had very in, uh, industrial and uh, medical uses. They're good germicide at some frequencies and at some other frequencies, they're very good at curing certain adhesives. So there was an economic uh, reason to develop the UV lights uh, for, you, for, for, you, for fluorescent mineral collecting. You need, in addition to that light, a filter because mercury vapor by itself puts out a lot of UV, but also some visible light. The visible light swamps out what you're trying to see. So you get to filter out the visible so you can see the fluorescent from your mineral. Um, and that was, those were all developed in the 30s. And in the 50s, it was used as long as, uh, along with Geiger counters in uranium prospecting. And uh, fluorescent mineral collecting, of course, came later. And today we have lamps that are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And a lot of them um, are long wave only, particularly those... Uh, But they're cheap and they have much greater intensity. So even though they're long wave, the higher intensity is allowing beginners to see things that we couldn't see before. So they're becoming quite popular. Why were the long waves and short waves 254 nanometers and 365? It wasn't for, 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 for less than mineral collecting. It was bulbs that were designed for industrial uses, the germicides and the curing. So all the fluorescent mineral collecting history is based not on something that was selected that was good for fluorescent minerals, but had these industrial uses and the fluorescent mineral collectors were able to buy those lights that existed. So now with the many different lights that we have, you could go back through the collections and you'd see many different things because the response you get depends upon the frequency uh, that you're using. Uh, and this is just a little slide that's reminding us if you want to uh, look at uh, fl uh, fluorescence minerals, you got to have your glass tubes, a very specific material. The quartz glass will not support, well, not transmit the long wave. 
And for the long wave, you need a borosilicate glass rather than a uh, than the quartz glass. Now, the new mid-wave bulbs that came out recently, they do not have, <coughs> they have phosphors to create the 315 millimeters. The long, old long wave and the short waves do not have phosphors. They just have the correct kind of glass and appropriate filters. And that's the end of that section. <laughs>